Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed that, that Mr. Lawrence Turner's talk. It's very inspiring and uh, eye-opening, I imagine. Um, um, today, uh, we're going. Uh, the two of us are going to talk about the really basic uh, 101 class about how to hire a lawyer and when to hire a lawyer and what to think about before hiring a lawyer. Anyway. My name is Mariko Kageyama. I'm a third year uh, law student at the University of Washington School of Law, and I am a student member of the Entrepreneur Law Clinic, and along with me. And I'm Anne Feifley. I'm also a third year law student at the University of Washington, and as mentioned, we're both in the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic. So today, uh, uh, for the next uh, half an hour or so, we are going to discuss that uh, really important yet basic aspects of the how to, when to, and uh, how to work with a lawyer. So the first of all, uh, we have to give you the uh, quick disclaimer, uh, typical uh, language. Um, that, that, that our presentation is just to uh, share the general information um, and then uh, we are not your uh, attorneys. We're not representing your business. So uh, just make sure that when you have uh, um, questions uh, cons uh, specific to your businesses, companies, uh, please consult your uh, legal and tax advisors. So this is uh, um, today's agenda uh, for the next half an hour to show you the roadmap where we are headed to. So first, uh, we are going to uh, highlight what big question you, you should ask. Uh, primarily, um, whether you should hire a lawyer or not to help you uh, grow your business. Uh, and then uh, we are going to show that the both aspects on what can go wrong if you're trying to do everything on your own versus uh, what can go right by uh, hiring a right person as an attorney to help you navigate your business. Second, we are going to uh, illustrate uh, very typical legal issues you may encounter. Um, and uh, also, uh, we're going to uh, you know, pick up several uh, anecdotes and uh, discuss the, the very typical issues you should better be aware of before you bump into those problems. And third, um, once you decide to uh, hire a lawyer, then that, that's, you're on the right track. Uh, but next, you have to choose the right kind of person to help you. And so that, you know, there are lots of attorneys out there, but you would like to choose the right lawyer for your business. So uh, there are several factors you would like to consider for hiring a lawyer. And finally, uh, once you uh, picked the right lawyer for you, your business, then uh, you would like to get the most out of your uh, lawyer because you pay, you hire that person to work with you. So you, uh, you really want to make sure that, that you, you ask the right questions for that per person, and then they understand your business needs. And then hopefully we'll have that, that remaining time uh, allocated for the question and answer session. So as mentioned, we thought we'd start with some other things that can go wrong if you don't have a lawyer involved in your business. Uh, so first, when you're first starting up your business, uh, you might run into a founder dispute. I don't know if you've all have seen the social network, but that's probably the most famous example of founder disputes. A lawyer can help you either head those off or help you more easily resolve them. Uh, another example, this is a very famous case we learned in law school. You might have heard of the beauty company Urban Decay. The way that started was two friends. They had a handshake deal. They didn't have anything written down. Eventually, down the road, a dispute arose. There was no document, no paper to uh, point to. And ultimately, the court found um, for the partner that was disputing, she had been forced out. And so she ended up with a lot of the profits of the company. And if you had written that down, that wouldn't have happened. Um, 
So really, it's not only just writing things down that a lawyer can help you with, it's helping you know, write them down in the right way to really capture the intent of you and your co-founders. Another really common issue that you can run into is employment and hiring. Um, everyone's probably heard of the difference between employees and independent contractors. That's a really easy thing to mess up. Uh, the Department of Labor has six different factors for independent contractors, and they're all very fact-specific, very involved. Um, probably one of the most famous is, everyone knows, independent contractor, independence right in the name, they usually can direct their own work, uh, while an employee has more directions from their boss. But that factor gets even more involved. And then the other half of the word, contractor, you know, implies a more limited working relationship, a limited term, while employee, you might expect to be at a company for a couple years. But again, there's four other factors that all get pretty fact specific that we need to drill into. Um, if you do mess this up, this can result in a lot of uh, cost to you and your company. Employees are owed different things than independent contractors. Uh, for example, employees get benefits, they have to be paid minimum wage, um, you take taxes out of their salary. So if you classify someone as an independent contractor and it turns out under those six factors they're actually an employee, that's going to result in having to pay back all those wages, pay those taxes, and also the state might even charge you a penalty. Washington, for example, will come audit your company to make sure you're classifying everyone you've hired correctly. Uh, it can also interfere with some of the IP ownership, the way that the contracts are drafted, excuse me, for independent contractors versus employees can be a little bit different and impact your IP ownership. And Mariko's gonna address that further. Yes, so Anne, as Anne pointed out, the IP ownership is a really important uh, first question you should think about even before you're forming uh, your company. Uh, uh, you might have heard uh, that form like uh, invention, um, allocation, uh, how to uh, assign the IP uh, from the individual uh, inven inventor, creator to your company. Basically, that means that if you don't have, you own that IP, whether the patent or trademarks or trade secrets or the copyrighted material, um, you don't basically have control. And so um, if you take it lightly that, uh, you know, we just uh, shake our hands and then we, we pay for this uh, person to develop a mobile app for our company, but actually they realize, wow, this person is, we, we don't know whether he's actually classified as an employee or independent contractor. And that could go really uh, into the legal issues down the road. So it's very important to make sure in a um, legal uh, agreement to clarify that the who owns the IP, and if, if the, your company doesn't own the IP, then make sure that the, you um, uh, arrange with that, negotiate with that uh, IP owner to transfer those rights over to your company uh, using the right terms. So, uh, now you learn that all that uh, uh, terrible thing that could potentially happen to your company if you don't hire a lawyer and uh, if you try to do by yourself. But what could go right by hiring a lawyer? Uh, it's a lot of, um, lot of things you can think about uh, that, that attorneys definitely bring you the, the value and resources for you. Uh, first, uh, the, Attorneys uh, can give you that uh, strategic decision-making advices. Uh, um, when you uh, hit the, all the major uh, decision-making points where the uh, legal issues pop up, whether it could be uh, that uh, forming a company or to um, seeking the funding or the allocating equity or the hiring people and IP issues, all of those uh, require that strategic decision making, that's where attorneys, lawyers uh, step in and give you the really uh, great advice for you. And second, uh, the le legal um, counselors not only uh, just give you that the good suggestion, but actually uh, they listen to your very specific concern, needs, and wants, and your vision and goals. So they, they can um, tailor uh, specific uh, advice and the package deal to you as a, this is a uh, way to solve your issues and this is an alternative option you could think about. And then they are also trained to that, uh, spot that legal issues before that issues pop up. 
So uh, it's, it, it's important to have a lawyer and that, that that's a way to go. Similarly, lawyers can help you anticipate and prevent problems. Uh, for example, the way that corporations act is through board meetings and then documenting those decisions. Lawyers can help you document the decisions your corporation makes correctly so that later, as we mentioned in the previous slide, there's no disputes later on about what happened. The lawyer is going to help you capture that correctly. It'll also, lawyers are also going to do things like Mariko mentioned, making sure you get all of your IP into your company. A lawyer is going to help you do that so that later there's no dispute about this or it's documented correctly. Um, to help you deal with unavoidable issues, there will be things that come up in any company's life cycle. Uh, for example, if you're looking for funding and you're seeking investors, those investors are going to want to do due diligence about your company. A lawyer is going to help you with that due diligence process. They're going to help you organize your documents and make sure everything's been done correctly. And then finally, um, as Michael alluded to earlier, lawyers will help guide your company. Um, for example, they can help you uh, with funding cycles uh, at the correct time for your company and the correct time in funding trends. Um, so all these ways that lawyers are going to be able to help you. Uh, so on this slide, we wanted to highlight some common issues that startups will face. Uh, it's a quick disclaimer before we get into it. This is going to really depend on your company and your circumstances. A lot of these could very rapidly change. Uh, for example, I want to point out corporate formation, which we put a little bit lower on the slide. If it's you and a friend, a corporate formation can be pretty easy. But for example, if you're spinning out from a company, that can get more complicated as you're forming your new corporation. If you're coming from a university, there can be tricky IP issues that will impact your formation. Or if you and a friend are coming from, uh, let's just say Microsoft, and you're all leaving to start your new company, there can be issues with your employment agreements. Who owns that IP? Did you make it at Microsoft or not? Things like that. Um, so Microsoft also might not want you to solicit your friends who work at Microsoft. So it can get a little bit more complicated, even though we've got it pretty simple down here. Also, I want to flag equity allocation. Um, that can be pretty easy, but again, it can get rapidly more complicated. I don't know if you guys watched that HBO show, Silicon Valley, um, where, for example, Richard goes to a meeting uh, with an investor. He's forming his own company, and he doesn't know what a cap table is. A lawyer could have helped him make that before the meeting and <laughs> head off a problem. And Mariko's going to address some of the IP issues on this slide as well. So um, as this spectrum shows that, uh, again, that uh, your business uh, circumstances fall, fall into any uh, dot in this graph. But uh, say, for example, your startup uh, don't own IP at all, but start creating the IP uh, from scratch. Then that's, uh, that's when you should start thinking about, again, that how to uh, transfer the ownership from the you know, potential inventor to the company, or that when you hire someone and then who contribute to that to your company to create the IP, then uh, in that employment agreement, you should indicate what the deal is in terms of the IP uh, assignment. And whereas if your company is already a, has a brand name service or the brand name products, and you already have owned the patent, for example, then you, the, your situation is completely different from the first situation. Um, you may want to start commercializing those IP based on the, the IP assets you already own. And then you start uh, negotiating with the, your business partners and develop the commercial agreements. And also, you would like to start thinking about you know, how to um, maximize your IP uh, assets value uh, by strategically using that IPs in your business development. So now you're at the point where you've identified one of these issues on the chart, and, it's, and you think it's time to hire a lawyer. Um, so here are a few of the logistical things you might want to think about. Uh, at the top, we put fee arrangements. Uh, cost is often the most important factor for a lot of people. Um, you've probably heard that lawyers are generally paid by the hour, but there are alternate fee arrangements. Um, so when lawyers talk about these alternate fee arrangements, we mean things like equity. Sometimes firms, especially on the West Coast, will take equity in your startup. Um, they'll also do capped packages. Um, so you'll say up to a certain amount, we'll do this work, and if it gets more complicated, we can renegotiate. And then finally, you can do flat fees. Sometimes a lawyer might say, okay, I'll incorporate your company for $2,000, just as an example. Um, so it's often these smaller startups when these, your company is new that you can get one of these alternate fee arrangements. But as you get more complicated, you'll probably move to hourly. Just as a very rough guideline, after about a round or two of VC funding, a firm will probably move you to an hourly arrangement just because you're, your company is growing. You're getting bigger. You're more complicated. 
So in addition to the fee arrangement, uh, another big question you would like to ask uh, potential uh, future uh, lawyer to work with you is that, um, so, um, so what's your experience in particular uh, field? For example, that uh, have you previously worked with the startups uh, businesses like what we're trying to do? Um, and uh, you know, experience doesn't necessarily mean how many years in the you know practice of law. Uh, obviously, the hundreds of lawyers out there uh, with uh, 20, 30 you know years of experience in general practice of law, whereas uh, some you know uh, younger attorneys may have um, much uh, you know less experience. However, uh, when you have a particular uh, legal issues. Uh, such as, say, cryptocurrencies or artificial intelligence or the, all the new technology, high technology involved, then uh, perhaps, you know, those younger attorneys with a uh, um, few years' experience with those, you know, new uh, emerging legal um, area of law uh, might be more comfortable working with you than uh, seeking advice from the um, senior uh, pa partners who, with uh, 20 years of experience. So just another consideration. Another thing you might want to think about is the resources your lawyer has access to. Um, if they're in a bigger firm, their firm might have offices in more places. And for example, if you incorporate in Delaware and they've got an office there, that can be really handy. You also want to think about are there people in their firm they can ask different questions to. For example, the lawyer incorporating you and helping you issue equity is probably not the same lawyer that's going to help you with your patent down the road. And it's definitely not going to be the same lawyer that helps you if you have any immigration issues going on. So lawyers have different areas of expertise and you want to know if they have a subject matter expert that they can consult. Um, similarly, this relates to the next point, connections. Uh, not only connections to lawyers in their firm, outside their firm to help you with these different legal issues, but you want to know if they have connections to maybe investors in the community or other folks they can ask um, to help you out like board or other advisors. So in addition to the logistical aspects of the hiring lawyer, uh, definitely you would like to think about the soft factors that basically that, that someone who, uh, who are going to work with you as a business partners. So you would like to double check that the, um, your, you know, your, the person you're speaking to really understands your business needs. Uh, are you comfortable communicating with this person? Uh, especially if you're uh, targeting audience, you know, customer's base is a minority community, for example. Uh, does this person really understanding uh, this minority, you know, community's needs and wants? Uh, it's a really good, Im important question to ask. In addition, you also think about the lawyer as a, the, the part of your team members and how to build that, you know, team. And uh, when you ask, uh, ask questions to the lawyer candidates, uh, it, it's important to check with that person that uh, who uh, are you going to bring in uh, to our team, just uh, you as a partner or associate uh, a lawyer, uh, how to split up uh, the time and resources between that, the lawyer team to help us doing the documentations and uh, checking that the, the business performance or to bring in that the uh, potential investors. So uh, those are another important questions you would like to address. Next, you might want to think about your lawyer's reputation in the community. Do other lawyers like working with this person? If you're, for example, if someone's going to buy your company, you've been very successful, is your lawyer going to work well uh, with the buyer's lawyers? If your lawyer is really antagonistic and people don't like working with them, that's going to be more time, more expense for you. So think about how they work with others in the community. It'll also be important, for example, if, we, if they need to bring in a subject matter expert on some issue. You'd want to make sure they have a good working relationship. Um, similarly, if this is important to you, you might want to ask about their involvement on like boards of nonprofits or other pro bono activities they do, if that's something that you value. And then finally, you want to know how attentive this person is. You're really making sure that your communication styles match up. If you are the kind of person who wants to pick up the phone at 3 a.m. and have a phone call with your lawyer, you better make sure that matches up. Or if you are a little bit more into going home at 6 and having dinner with your family, you can also make sure that your lawyer's style matches up with that. So really, now that you've considered all these things and you've hired your attorney, you want to make sure that you're getting the most value. Um, 
First, a lawyer can be a trusted confidant for you. You might have heard of attorney-client privilege, and so the things that you tell your lawyer are going to be confidential. That makes them a really valuable person to have really hard conversations with if you need to. If you're having any conflicts in your company, you have concerns about your IP litigation is coming up, you're going to have all these tough conversations with your lawyer. Similarly, we've touched on how a lawyer can be a great strategic advisor for you. They've got experience with businesses like yours. They know the funding cycles. They know who's funding what right now. They can give you a lot of great advice. And because uh, of that confidentiality, it's all secure. And we are wrapping up our presentation, but you want to take away today from us that uh, you really want to hire an attorney that at the really critical juncture of your business decision making. Uh, starting from that, uh, actually the forming your business, company, uh, the how to allocate uh, equity, you know, when you start hiring people, and then you have to uh, work with the IP, and those are important critical junctures, you really want to seek that uh, law uh, lawyer's advice. And then, um, once you hire an attorney, uh, it's, you know, they are, they are there to uh, answer your questions, but it's, uh, it's also that, uh, important to remember that uh, um, when you um, uh, anticipate any legal issues uh, or the risk uh, you have to face, uh, it's better to seek uh, consultation sooner uh, than later because, again, that uh, uh, addressing the issues and prevent uh, the issues from becoming worse. Um, that it's much better than the, um, fixing the problems later. Uh, that that if you leave that problems open, that will come back and uh, haunt you. So it, these are really important points that, that you should take away. So real quick, before we open it up to any questions, we do want to plug the Entrepreneurial Law Clinic. As you mentioned in the beginning, both Mariko and I are students in the clinic right now. Uh, as a brief overview for the clinic, uh, we usually serve uh, very small businesses pro bono. So people come to the clinic, they apply, they have a meeting with students as well as uh, the student supervising attorneys who are experienced in the area. They meet, we ask you questions about your business, and then we identify legal issues for you, how to solve them, and then next steps. Um, so you can find us at our website or the other info on the slide. And we just want to thank you again all for coming. And if you have any questions, we'd love to take them now. Thank you. Yeah, in the back. Sure, so the question was if there's like online rating services for lawyers, and there are. Um, there's services, I know there's one called Avo, um, and it can be, yeah, so the, it exists, but it can be hard to tell how accurate that information is, um, and so I don't know if it should be your last stop when you're searching for a lawyer, but it will, could be a first stop, and like they certainly exist. Yes, I hear that the uh, horrible thing about the Avo. <laughs> so uh, I don't personally recommend, but uh, sure, there are a lot of online resources to uh, sort of uh, you know, give you the initial sense of that, uh, uh, how that legal market looks like uh, when it comes to your particular specific legal uh, questions or the needs. Uh, but again, I think that the, um, do your own homework and then trying to uh, obtain that the more uh, trustworthy um, source of information. I cannot pinpoint where they are, but uh, certainly that some of the discussion, we, we discussed uh, topics that we discussed that uh, uh, hopefully get you started. I guess I, there is a more trustworthy source. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't call, recall it off the top of my head, but the Washington State Bar Association, so that's all the lawyers in Washington, um, you can go to their website and they do have a lawyer uh, referral service, and so that's another way to start because then it's kind of lawyer, uh, it's a more collected list and I think it's a little bit more trustworthy if you go through the State Bar Association. Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, so this is a very, uh, the question was, uh, how does the entrepreneurial law clinic feel about form banks online? Um, it's a good idea, bad idea, and let me give you the very lawyer answer of it depends. Uh, the clinic currently does not have any form banks, and I think the reluctance to do that is um, kind of as we showed you on that uh, chart, it can be sometimes an issue like incorporation can be easy, but it can be really hard. And so an online form bank can't capture all the circumstances of your company and, your circ uh, and just the facts of what's happening. So we'd really prefer that you come in and have a chat with us and apply to the clinic and really get that more personalized service. And I think our supervising attorney has a thought also. <laughs> So like making a like initial contact with a firm, and you're, I mean like all the major firms have websites, and so you can kind of like decide which one to initially approach based on the entire firm or based on particular like attorney bios. Do you recommend choosing a firm based on the reputation of the firm or like trying to pick somebody specifically based on a bio? Um. This is not the lawyer's advice or the <laughs> legal advice, but I think it, that, that both approaches are, that are I think, appropriate. Uh, uh, the firm's reputation is a big factor, especially that the uh, firm's uh, reputation in terms of their resource that they can offer for this you know, particular industry or the community, you know, Seattle, that the startups community, you know, they totally understand that, uh, or, the, or the, you know, one firm's a branch office is you know, happened to be in Seattle, but uh, they don't really, you know, uh, have a close, close niche tie with the startups community here. Then perhaps that's not the right choice for you. Uh, also, that the individual attorneys' bios are really important areas to check out. And then, oftentimes, that that the law firms' uh, websites can provide that the, uh, um, uh, you know, list of the um, partners and associates and then with their uh, biography and the strength and their previous experiences of the major cases they worked on. So those are the uh, area that you would like to uh, uh, research further. So is it appropriate to just contact an associate directly? Do you, I mean, do you need to contact the, you know, the main number or one of the partners? Or if you see an associate bio that seems to have I think Kari has some input on this. <laughs>
Any other question? All right, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.